Hello, this and my other YouTube videos are extracted from the History of Man series, currently six books published in print, ebook, and most importantly, audiobook. I'm a storyteller, and if you like these video stories, you'll love the History of Man series audiobooks. Great for commuting or just sitting back and relaxing. And unlike a novel you've read where you know the ending, you can listen to these books on tape more than once. There's so much to learn. Available on Amazon and audible.com, I narrate the audiobooks. And the best part about that is you can listen to these stories without having to look at my stupid face. And with that said, let's get the show on the road. Hello, John Bershoff, History of Man series. Today's subject, Serendipity, Part 4, Archimedes. I'm not sure this next story exactly qualifies as serendipity, since the guy in question, Archimedes, was more of a pasture, chance favors the prepared mind kind of guy. But our story takes place in the third century BC. This great Greek mathematician, Archimedes, was born in Syracuse, Sicily, Italy, 287 BC. For whatever reason, it was actually the Greeks who first settled Syracuse in 734 BC, and for that matter, settled the entire island of Sicily. Those living on mainland Italy who spoke Latin and who would one day become the Roman Empire which was founded by Romulus, from which is derived Roman, along the Palatine Hills of what would become Rome along the Tigris River, occurred around 700 BC, but for whatever reason, they never settled the islands around their country. It is safe to say that the Greek Empire, its roots, its roots from the ashes of the Mycenaean civilization of 1600 BC, predates the Roman Empire, which is why their descendants, such as Archimedes, could be born Greek on an island so very close to Italy, and which is now part of Italy. They had a 1,000 year head start to colonize Mediterranean islands. Archimedes was a first class mathematician, one of the greatest in history. He gave us pi, which is the constant, the immutable relationship of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. No matter how large a circle is, its circumference is always pi times diameter. Interestingly, it was not called pi, nor given the Greek alphabet letter pi until 1706, when mathematician William Jones used the Greek letter pi for pi. I apologize, but prior to that, I'm not sure what Archimedes and subsequent mathematicians called pi. In equations, they likely wrote it out to several digits, 3.14. Maybe they called it Archimedes constant, but not pi. Archimedes was related to the king of Sicily, Herod II, and it was likely the king who sent Archimedes to Alexandria, Egypt, which housed the greatest library in the world the Library of Alexandria, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, along with the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia, the Mausoleum at Helicarnassus, the Temple of Artemis, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Lighthouse of Alexandria, and of course, the Great Pyramids of Giza. The Great Pyramids are the only treasure of the seven wonders of the ancient world that is still with this world. While studying at Alexandria, no doubt Archimedes crossed paths with Euclid, the guy who gave us geometry, you know, Euclidean geometry. Euclid was born in 300 BC, was wandering through the library of Alexandria, and was likely nearing the end of his illustrious life as Archimedes was beginning his. I'm sure the two mathematicians had much to chat about, over the scrolls and goblets of wine. Okay, one day, King Harrow commissioned a Sicilian goldsmith to create a votive crown. 
for his temple, a crown made of pure gold. A votive is an offering or consecration as payment or thanks for fulfillment of a vow. Once it has been consecrated, it cannot be destroyed. It is, for lack of a better phrase, a holy relic that belongs with the gods. When the votive crown was completed by the goldsmith and given back to King Harrow, he consecrated it. But the king began to have a nagging feeling that the goldsmith had cheated the king by not using all of the gold. And to further the deception, the king also suspected the goldsmith might have alloyed or mixed silver with the gold in order to maintain the same weight. Alloyed silver into gold, unless it's too much, will not change the appearance. But weight and mass are two different things, as you will soon discover. The king tasked his brilliant nephew, Archimedes, to figure out if the goldsmith had bamboozled the king. Archimedes could weigh the crown to see if the weight matched the weight given to the goldsmith by the king, but, but that would not tell him if the gold, if all the gold had been used, especially if it had been alloyed with silver. So weight was not going to give him the answer. You know, geometry in the third century BC, thanks to Euclid and Euclidean geometry, was pretty nifty, at least for things like squares and circles and angles and cubes. Many a young boys and girls, when I was young, including myself, walked into second period geometry where the fun of life went to die. But nothing in Euclidean geometry could help Archimedes with the task the king had given him. The young lad retired to his home, grabbed a bottle of wine, no doubt, pulled a warm bath, and plopped into the tub, soaking his weary bones to contemplate the problem. That Archimedes had his own private bath was something of a luxury. Only royalty and the wealthy had private tubs where servants heated water for their masters. All the other folk, if they wanted to bathe, if they bathed at all, used public baths. The Greeks were not great bathers, but they did bathe, mostly for hygiene reasons. They weren't dumb. The Greeks understood this. It was actually the Romans, though, with their Roman baths that brought the act of bathing into an art form. Romans would bathe in large communal baths called thermi, more like swimming pools to us, where they discuss current affairs, conduct business, men bathe with women, adults bathe with children, wealthy bathe with servants, even those with private baths still enjoy the pleasure of public baths, and none of them wore clothes. Roman baths were the great equalizer. They even had these side rooms surrounding these large bath areas where private business could be conducted or where a man and a woman could conduct private business, if you catch my drift. It took the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of the church in Rome to literally outlaw public baths. They were, in the eyes of the church, sinful. Now, it was unclear if it was when Archimedes first got into his bathtub to contemplate the task of the votive crown or when he emerged from the bathtub. But what he noticed was one serendipitous event. The water level changed. That is, his mass had effect on the level of the water in the tub. It is said Archimedes ran through the streets of Syracuse, butt naked, yelling, Eureka! 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 Which meant was he had figured it out. What something says at the exact moment of discovery can be anything like, hmm, or what's this? Or that's funny. Or that's curious. Or that's odd. Or wait a minute. Or what do we have here? Or Eureka, which is from the Greek, of course, and means I have found it. What Archimedes had found that the mass of the votive crown could be measured and compared to the initial weight of gold and its mass given to the goldsmith by the king, water displacement of the mass. Weight might change, but mass never does. Consider this, if you weigh 150 pounds on earth, your mass is 68 kilograms. Now, kilogram is a measure of mass, not weight, although we often interchange them. 
If you dunk yourself completely into a tub of water on Earth, you'll displace 68 kilograms of mass. If you then go to the moon, take off all your clothes in your fancy schmancy lunar module, and weigh yourself, due to much less gravity, your weight will be six times less, or 24.75 pounds, not 150 pounds. But if you submerge yourself in a tub of water inside the lunar module, your mass will still be 68 kilograms. Archimedes dunked the boat of crown into a container of water to measure its mass. Its mass was not what the original weight of gold was when given to the goldsmith. The goldsmith did not use all of the gold and he had also alloyed less expensive silver into the gold. Archimedes dutifully reported his findings to the king. The king had been duped. Now history is unclear exactly what happened to that goldsmith. Rather silent on the subject, in fact. But it was, after all, Sicily. My guess is the goldsmith was submerged in the beautiful coastline off Sicily in the classic Sicilian way. He swam with the fishes. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode of History of Man series. I have six books out. This is the first History of Man series. There are six of them. I'm writing more. It's a style of writing called Jumping Off where I have base subject of medicine and science, but I jump off into other stories of history, geology, astronomy, art, music, sports, you name it. Come back to the original, then jump off again. It's an unusual style of writing. It's not common, but I promise you with every turn of the page, you'll learn something. I certainly did. These books are available in print, in ebook, Kindle, and audiobook, where I do the narrating. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much for listening and be well.